Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have the excellent pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast. That's Matt Schiffman. How are you today, Matt? I am good, Brian. Ready for our Kentucky Derby show number two after all of the derby preps are over and there's a lot to talk about oh there's always a lot to talk about matt and and you know what looking back at last year with rich strike winning at 80 to 1 odds the pace we've always said it but the pace is important in the kentucky derby that played a gigantic part in why a long shot like rich strike could win the kentucky derby last year they ran too fast early I kind of thought that might happen ahead of time, and I bet accordingly. Uh, this year, I'm not so sure, Matt. Let's jump into our pace projection for the 2023 Kentucky Derby right now. We're going to start with Time Form US, Matt. And, oh, boy, there's a lot of chiclets on this page. There, there sure is, Brian. Goodness, it uh, looks like a pack of those uh, when the uh, chiclets came in, the multicolored packs. That's right. And, and Matt, there's only 17 chiclets there. So if they had all 20, uh, it, it would really be, really be crowded, really be a little confusing. But let's leave this up for a while. Let's take our time to go through it. As always, we think for ourselves, Matt, and I don't know if, if I agree with the time form U.S. pace projector here completely. The first thing I'm going to notice up in the upper right, it, it's projecting a fast pace. And I'm not so sure, to tell you the truth, because I don't see any speed balls in here. Number one, I don't see any speed balls in here. But number two, I always feel like there's a little bit of correction when things get wacky from year to year. It, it hadn't been a while since it had been a while since there was a really fast pace. Last time it happened, the Japanese horse ran so fast early. And it really collapsed. The pace collapsed last year. Usually when that happens, I think the following year, there's a little bit of a correction. I don't know if I agree with the fast pace that they're projecting this year. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Brian. I, I think the main reason I feel that way is overall, looking at this field and looking at the performances in the, all of the derby preps as we have been doing all year long, it's just not a fast bunch, Brian. I almost none of those races maybe except for the uae derby uh were run particularly fast there's always the factor of of you know the commotion of the derby the adrenaline of uh 20 horses going on the gate the adrenaline for the horses and the jockeys breaking from the gate that certainly always makes it easy to say that there's going to be a fast pace. But I feel like a fast pace for this bunch is not a particularly fast pace. Okay, yeah. I, I won't disagree with any of that. And and what we've seen uh, uh, many years is it's kind of a, a, a cavalry charge to get position out of the gate. And the first quarter can be a little quick. But then after that, it, it slows into a nice, easy pace as jockeys are trying to save something for the stretch run of the mile and a quarter Kentucky Derby. I think that's more likely to be the case this year where, yeah, there's some, there's some uh, race riding going on in the first furlong or two, but after that it slows down to a more moderate pace. That's what at least I'm kind of thinking. And, and, and it sounds like maybe you too. Anyway, let's look at the horses here on the time form us pace projector. Interestingly, the horse on the front, and that might be because he's inside the other two horses, who are also out there on their pace projector is confidence game. And, and boy, I don't know. I mean, confidence game has shown some speed on occasion, but of course his only recent race, which is going back now a couple months or more, he came from off the pace. Yeah, Brian, uh, uh, that's a curious one. The other one that I found particularly curious was um, when, with the addition of Jace's road into the field, a lot of the talk that I heard prior to that happening that was if Jace's road got in the field, it was going to en enhance the early pace. And here we have the time form U.S. pace projector uh, with uh, Jace's road showing up in the 
looks like the third wave of horses. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that. I, I, I agree with that and also uh, what you heard about Chase's Road. And, and remember, Chase's Road is uh, uh, one of the Brad Cox horses. And um, the other Brad Cox horse is a horse that'll be farther back. I, I think there might be some thought to Chase's Road being a little bit closer to the pace than, it's, than you can see here. And the horse that he chased last time in the Louisiana Derby is number eight, Kings Barnes. Of the favorites, you see him most prominently displayed there on the rail, uh, pretty close to the early pace. He's a horse who certainly could be out there again after wiring the Louisiana Derby. Yeah, and, you know, uh, Brian, it, 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 it's interesting that, you know, we're 10 years past the, into the points era, which began – in 2013 when orb was the other deep closer to win the derby since uh we went into the points era so we're kind of got bookends here with orb closing from the back of the pack uh in the first year of the points era and rich strike doing it last year but they're uh, throwing a little pace history in here brian uh, they're the only two deep closers to win the derby in the points era so uh, you know what does that mean does that mean you know we're going to go a whole bunch more years i don't know um but that's the case the other eight uh, or, uh finishes have been divided up with three front runners and five stalkers and what's interesting with those eight um uh, combined those eight winners without that pace did not did not run in any position farther back than third in this history i'm going with the the horses that cross the finish line first so keep that in mind with the two years where there was a disqualification yeah and i think that's i think that's very important matt it's a good point um for me, it boils down to simply points era and no points era, fast pace or not a fast pace, contentious pace, where a lot of horses who would have a shot uh, uh, suddenly become less of a factor in the Kentucky Derby. And, you know, you talked about 10 years with Orb. That was a very fast pace. You talked about last year with Rich Strike, obviously a very fast pace. Some other horses who've won in this century, Giacomo was a big long shot, fast pace. Mind That Bird was a big long shot, fast pace. Street Sense beat a lot of good horses, came from way back, fast pace. So that's why we do this show, and that's why we're talking so much about the projected pace of this Kentucky Derby. Getting back to the time form U.S. pace projector, Matt, uh, Kings Barnes, I think, could be on the lead. He could be sitting close, but I think of the contenders, he's the one with the most early speed. He's the one that could most benefit from a – moderate early pace uh other favorites you see here interestingly right there in the middle with the horse you already mentioned jace's road or, or maybe slightly forward of middle you have two of the favorites in forte the one on this list these are points uh, uh standings that's their numbers as of now of course that'll change with the post position draw on monday and number two practical move interesting that they're right there together um, I've been a fan of Practical Move this year, Matt, and I, I I could see Practical Move being closer to a moderate pace, certainly than Forte. And that's one of the reasons I think Practical Move has a real shot to beat Forte uh, in, in a week and a half in the Kentucky Derby, is I think he could be closer, he could be less affected by traffic, and he could get first jump on Forte. Yeah, and, and I... <clears throat> Going back to the history, I'm always concerned about horses that are deep closers, horses or just closers, horses that are going to be farther back. It's just more difficult uh, to, to win the Derby from back there. Everything has to go your way. Uh, you know, and, and again, this year I kind of feel like, and, and in other years, um, yeah, the fast pace is absolutely important, but uh, – it's not just always the fast pace. It, it's also the fact that, to me, the majority of these three-year-olds are just not going to get 
the mile and a quarter distance. Yeah, they're not going to get the mile and a quarter distance. It's farther than they want. Um, but uh, to me, that that fast pace or moderate pace or slow pace really affects things because the, uh, another thing a fast pace does, which helps the closers, Matt, is a fast pace spreads out the field a little bit more. And that gives you a little bit more room to maneuver for all those closers that I was talking about before. Mind that bird and Street Sense and Giacomo and Orb and, and Rich Strike. We'll see. Again, we're looking at the favorites and what just what Matt said is 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 true for me as well. I generally I don't like a horse who's going to be near the last early in a race where I, I'm not considering it a very fast pace. Two fills, one of my top contenders is right there with Forte and Practical Move. He's the five. Uh, I could see him a little closer than Forte, perhaps, but he's the five there. Um, but uh, some other major contenders, uh, 14, by the way, is Sun Thunder. And he didn't even make this chart because they, they think he's last of the last of all. And he, he's too far back to include on this chart, but the two you see on the chart that are last and second to last are two of the main contenders in my eyes. Number three, Angel of Empire, number four, Tapa Trice. They have them way back here in this pace projector. Yeah, and and that's daunting, Brian. Um, and and I'm certainly a very big fan of Tappet Trice, and a, a fan of Forte also, who is been running from significantly uh, off the pace. And you throw in Angel of Empire, you're talking about three of the four top choices, and are you? getting the right odds, and we'll talk more about this in, in subsequent shows, are you getting the right odds to make a run from the back of the pack? Yeah, and, and you you put Forte in that bunch, and I'm not sure where he belongs in this pace projector. This year's a little bit more um, convoluted, if you will, as far as who is really speed, who is really mid-pack, and who is rally. We're going to take a shot at it, and you'll see our list in a second. But Timeform US certainly has Forte at well ahead of Angel and Empire, Angel of Empire and Tapit Trice, who are also big contenders here, Matt. Uh, I think importantly, the horses not on this list, uh, Continuar and Derma Sotokaki, the two Japanese horses, uh, Timeform US didn't want to put them in this. They don't feel like they have enough data to do it, but I think they, they're they pretty important here and we're going to see where they fall on our list. Because Derma Sotogaki is a scary horse coming from a big win in Dubai. And he's a horse who's versatile. Yeah, and he's a horse, that, you know, talking about him and Continuar, he's a horse that has a far better resume in terms of the kind of competition that he's faced than Continuar. All right. So, well, yeah, and he's beaten uh, Continuar in three straight, three different countries. This again, this will be the fourth country that their uh, uh, their continuing rivalry happens in the Kentucky Derby. All right, Matt, I put up our pace scenario here, and it's a little. It looks a little different. We don't have the fancy chicklets. We don't have twenty or seventeen horses listed on their graphic, uh, but we actually have twenty one horses here, and and we just broke them down into the most likely speed, the most likely horses who were pretty close to the pace. The most likely horses who are kind of certainly not on the lead, but not completely out of it early as well. And then finally, the late runners. You see that late runner list is the biggest list of all, Matt. And again, not projecting a super fast pace. At least I'm not. I like the horses that are this far back a little bit less in a race without a strong, strong pace. That includes Tapit Trice, Angel of Empire, Hit Show, Sun Thunder. Skinner, we put on this list at number 21. I, I still think there's a good chance he gets in. Ray's Kane and Lord Miles. Yeah, that, that is an interesting breakdown when you see the number of horses that are in the, the, the deep closer late runner list. And uh, they are, you know, a strong group when you, when you particularly point out Tapatrice, Angel of Empire, Hit Show, Skinner, the other three I'm a little less keen on, but those are some important players. 
Yeah, they're important players, and uh, they become less important players in the win because of what I've been saying. Probably not a super strong pace, and it's tough to win from 16th, 18th, 20th without that real strong pace. Let's go up to the front, the speed. And again, it, there's been no horses. You call them. There's just they're, they're not fast horses. I'm I'm saying that there's not a lot of consistent speed horses here. Arctic Arrogance has been consistent on, on the lead, but he's not in this race. So that left us with the most likely front runners being Kings Barnes, verifying horses who can stalk, but horses who might want to be on the lead in the Derby. Reincarnates another one. He's done some different things, but he has speed. And Jace's Road, the horse you mentioned before. Yeah. And uh, again, I, I really have trouble having a feeling for which horses from these first two groups are going to do what we are talking about, you know, the Derby we're talking about the fact that probably you've got 20 of the best riders on these horses. You're talking about these best riders who know what has been happening in the Derby over the years. They know that it's hard to win from that far back. They know that the Derby winner usually is in, on, on the lead. With an eighth of a mile to go, that makes it in on the turn. The Derby winner is usually on the lead. They know, know all of these things. So what what are they going to do? Are, are the, the, uh, the, the horses that we have in the deep closer group, are some of them going to try and stay closer? And, and that makes it hard for any of these horses to be asked to run outside of their usual style yeah outside of their usual style uh but also traffic concerns a lot of traffic concerns if we're right if the pace is not super fast the 20 horses become a little bit more bunched up it becomes even more difficult to weave your way through traffic tap it trice angel of empire both move pretty quickly pretty early in their last race Arkansas Derby, Angel of Empire got a beautiful trip. Tapid Trice also got a very good trip in the bluegrass. Things could be tougher. Yes, they might want to move earlier, as Matt said. The jockeys know. But if that traffic is bad, that traffic is bad. Uh, that makes me look more because of the speed, the, the four we have listed speed, I'm not loving any one of the four. I know Kings Barnes could be super talented. Verifying is, is talented. But those are horses I'm not really looking at in the win spot in the Kentucky Derby. So the, the two groups in the middle, Matt, really appeal to me here. The stalkers in the mid-pack, these are horses I'm looking at both out of price, but both both also as serious win contenders. Practical moves is there. And there's Derma Sotagaki. Um, versatile, but he's shown a pretty good, pretty good pace lately. And, of course, in the UAE Derby, he went right to the lead. That's a possibility in here. Termasota Gaki could be out there on the lead in the Kentucky Derby, and that is a scary proposition. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, yeah, Dermis Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, I agree with this that, that about uh, Dermasota Gaki. Uh, uh, he's a wild card in my eyes. He's a wild card in that. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not sure uh, that he's going to be as far back as being in the. Uh, the second wave of horses or the third wave of horses. I think they got to be pretty, the connection got to be pretty full of themselves after that performance uh, in the UAE Derby. <clears throat> and knowing obviously what we're saying, that this is not a particularly fast bunch, it could be pretty easy for them to say, we're going to go. I don't think they can keep up with us. Yeah, yeah, it's possible. It's possible. I think he's facing tougher competition than he did in the UAE Derby and, and probably a little bit stronger pace than he did in the UAE Derby. A lot could uh, matter how the how the break goes for these horses. But I would suspect that he is also, yeah, one of the first three, four, five, six horses early in the race. And, and he's scary there. I'm also ho hoping that practical move can be in that first wave of horses just behind the leaders. Maybe Rocket can, maybe Mage, maybe Confidence Game as long shots to consider who can be relatively close to the pace. And then the mid-pack, you know, those are horses who could be seventh early, they could be 10th early, but those horses have won the Kentucky Derby over the years a lot of times. And maybe I'm going a little bit farther back than the last 10 years, but those horses that are eighth early, 
make a move on the back stretch, are right there on the turn, and certainly poised to win at the top of the stretch. I could see that being Forte. I could see that being two fills. I could even see that being disarm. Yeah, absolutely, Brian. And and you know, it's what you were describing is so important. Uh, these jockeys uh, need to do so many things to win the Derby. Get the position that they want to get. If if it works out ideally, give their horse a chance to relax, get into a stride, and be ready to make their move. Um, it, 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 it's it's as I said before. It's a mile and a quarter. It's the only time that these horses most likely are ever going to run in a mile and a quarter race. Yeah. yeah. And for me, uh, last year, putting a capper on the space projecting today, last year I had a really good feeling of bet, uh, uh, about betting against horses that were on or near the lead. I, I thought it would be a fast pace. This year I'm just not having that same feeling. I think it's going to be a more bunched up group, which creates traffic. And again, horses who are closer or at least middle pack, I think will have a, a bigger advantage this year than uh, than last year. All right, Matt, let's switch gears. We want to go talk about the Phillies a little bit because the Kentucky Oaks is a big race that we haven't talked about a whole lot this year. And you know what, Matt, I, I think it's a weird year for the Kentucky Oaks. There's a reason we have been talking about the Kentucky Oaks a little bit less this year. There are some really good three-year-old fillies, to tell you the truth, who might be the best three-year-old fillies in the country that are not on this list. They don't have the points to get in the Kentucky Oaks this year for whatever reason. Punch Bowl is very lightly raced. Julia Shining hasn't made that breakthrough yet, and she's pretty lightly raced. Uh, Faza, certainly the best three-year-old filly out in California. She stuck with Bob Baffert, or her owner stuck with Bob Baffert. So she didn't have a chance to pick up any points. Those would be three of the favorites in this year, Kentucky Oaks, and none of them are in there this year. These are the 14 as of today that are in the Kentucky Oaks. Leading the way, of course, is Wet Paint, Matt. Daughter of Blame, trained by Brad Cox. She's on a roll of late. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, three for three this year for Brad Cox. Uh, uh, kind of, you know, we're used to big race. Brad Cox, horses that are winning the prep races three for three all of them at oakland park uh which is uh, uh something to keep an eye on won the fantasy stakes won the honeybee both grade threes won the martha washington which was the prep race into this kentucky oak series uh in uh uh, uh oakland park yeah there's a lot to like with wet paint i saw her in person down at oakland park and i was impressed with her that was a sloppy track and, and she's actually won on wet tracks three times she has one on a fast track that came last time in the fantasy the fantasy is grade three but uh I, I think the fantasy might be a little bit higher up on the kentucky oaks prep than your average grade three she's a rallier big field she'll be the favorite i don't think she'll be a heavy heavy favorite but she deserves to be the favorite but as matt said uh, all three of her stakes wins came at Oakland Park where she swept that series. So there, there's reason to believe that she could be beaten here. She is undefeated in four starts on the dirt. Next on the list, Matt, is Affirmative Lady. Affirmative Lady is getting better and better for trainer Graham Motion. Yeah, absolutely. A late developing uh, uh, three-year-old filly, uh, daughter of Arrogate. Um Started to get better, ran in the uh, Busanda at Aqueduct as a maiden, then broke her maiden at uh, Gulfstream Park, and then ended her prepping with a win in the Gulfstream Park Oaks. Yeah, and I, I don't know how strong the Gulfstream Park Oaks was this year. Uh, I think it doesn't quite hold up to some of the other preps. But again, this is a pretty wide open race. And the winner really could come from anywhere. But Affirmative Lady, a da uh, uh, daughter of Arrogate, as you mentioned, uh, looks to be getting better. She ran some decent stakes races before she ever broke her maiden. And, and now she's won two in a row at Gulfstream Park. S uh, a serious threat for sure for trainer Graham Motion. Next on the list is Defining Purpose, Matt. Defining Purpose has shown some flashes for trainer Kenny McPeak, who's had some good fillies for sure in recent years. Uh, but she uh, kind of broke through with a long shot win last time in the Ashland. Yes, after running uh, behind the top choice uh, wet paint in her prior uh, two races, 
when she was sixth in the Honey Bee and third in that Marsha Wa Martha Washington. I don't know. Um, uh, 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 this, but this is a pretty evenly bunched group of three-year-old fillies in my eyes. So uh, not sure what to expect uh, with this one putting two big performances back to back. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe it's tough. Uh, it's going to be tough for her to win two grade ones in a row. But on the other hand, you get pretty square odds on a grade one winner last time. Also, those losses to wet paint came on wet tracks, and she got a fast track last time in the Ashland. Next on the list is pretty mischievous. We we have her as 12 to 1. Of course, this is not the morning line. This will be drawn next week. The, these are our projections for what the odds might look like on Oaks Day. Pretty mischievous has been very consistent, Matt, the daughter of Into Mischief has uh, never finished out of the money, and she just keeps running first or second in a lot of these stakes races. Yep, good connections. Brandon Walsh, uh, a Godolphin uh, bred horse, so you know that uh, uh, besides um, being a daughter of uh, Into Mischief, you know they've, that this one's got a strong female side also. Uh, spent her preps in, uh, in New Orleans at the fairgrounds, was second in the fairground Oaks last time, but before that won the Rachel Alexandra. Yeah, it was second last time in the fairground Oaks, but she was pretty well beaten last time in the fairground Oaks by the five on this list. The five is South Lawn. Norm Cassie, the son of Mark Cassie, might be in line for his first huge win as a trainer out on his own. South Lawn listed at six to one on the morning line, our morning line, Matt. The daughter pioneer of the Nile switched from turf to dirt. Uh, her two races this year, she's only had two races this year. They're both on dirt and they're both eye-opening performances. Uh, both came at, uh, fairgrounds and they were powerful wins. Yeah, absolutely. Looks like an up and comer, uh, in here one and, uh, one an allowance race at fairgrounds as a prep for her big win in the fairground Oaks. Yeah, she won that allowance by more than eight. She won the Fairground Oaks by more than three. If you're looking for someone to beat wet paint in the Kentucky Oaks, South Lawn, in my eyes, is one of the top contenders. Promise Her America, a daughter of American Pharaoh, trained by Ray Handel, Matt, broke through with an upset win. I think she was about 26 to one in the Gazelle. Yeah, and let me tell you, Brian, there's no trainer that's hotter than Ray Handel uh, in New York uh, in the last couple months. He's been... Uh, winning at, at every level with claimers and maidens and uh in this uh, uh stakes race he's never won a big race like this but uh but an up-and-coming uh, uh trainer uh last time got that breakthrough win in the grade three gazelle after breaking her maiden at aqueduct yeah that's something to think about matt the fact that ray handel is hot and promise her america is still pretty lightly raced and coming off a game win in the Gazelle. How strong was the Gazelle? I don't know, but I actually like another horse a little bit coming out of the Gazelle, and that one is not named Promise Her America. Anyway, the next horse on the list, and tell me no lies. She was a stakes winner early on. In fact, she was a two-time grade one winner early on. I never was overly impressed with those grade one wins. She was winning last uh, summer into fall in California. She came to Kentucky for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies, really didn't do much. She's had two races this year, and she's been second, but not impressive. I'm not really loving and tell me no lies right now. Matt. Yeah, daughter of Arrogate. You mentioned the seconds, a second in the Santa Anita Oaks, a second in the Santa Isabella, trained by Peter Miller. You know, uh, oh, my positive comment can be uh, Peter Miller, you know, can uh, – can spring an upset now and then. Not with this one. Not with this one in my eyes. She, she'd be one that I don't have on my tickets, Matt. The second choice on our morning line, early morning line for the Kentucky Oaks, is another Brad Cox training. Of course, wet paint is Brad Cox, and so is Botanical. Matt, Botanical has been very impressive. She's bred to run the distance, a daughter, Medagliadoro. She's been very impressive, winning a bunch of races in a row, but none of them have come on dirt. Yeah, it's interesting. Brad Cox uh, has left uh, Botanical uh, at Turfway Park, where she is four for four, um, won two stakes races there, the Bourbonette Oaks most recently, and an allowance race in, in that uh, uh, list of races on the artificial surface. 
Um, I will say that uh, a lot of horses that have won races at Turfway Park were able to come back and run well on the dirt at Keeneland recently. Yeah, and, and it happens at Churchill Downs too. Uh, those tracks seem to carry over the uh, top of the surface there at uh, Turfway Park. And certainly no one on this list is hotter than Botanical. Uh, if you're looking at speed figures, I, I think she's got the best speed figures of the bunch. If she takes to Churchill Downs and the dirt track at dirt, uh, Churchill Downs, Botanical is a big threat not only to beat her stablemate wet paint, but to win the whole thing. Next on the list, Matt, Dorth Vader. I think she will be one of the longest shots on the board. Having said that, she uh, has won a couple of stakes down in Florida. Yeah. Uh, for uh, uh, a less known trainer, Michael Yates, uh, a daughter of Gervin. Um, Gervin, you know, who has been doing a pretty good job as a young, uh, as a young sire. Uh, most recently was fourth in the Gulfstream Park Oaks, but won the Devona Dale, a grade two at Gulfstream, before that. Yeah, she was a big long shot in the Devona Dale. She won it. She didn't run terribly poorly, went fourth in the Gulfstream Park Oaks. But on the other hand, I, I, I'm already on record saying I don't know how strong the Gulfstream Park Oaks was. So she's uh, she's probably a throwout for me. Next on the list is not a throwout. Gambling Girl will get Irad Ortiz Jr. up. 15 to 1. Um, if you watch that gazelle, it was a pretty slow pace, and she was the one way out in the middle of the track, gobbling up ground. Uh, she had come to Arkansas before that. She's run good races around two turns. Gambling Girl's a little interesting to me. Gambling Girl, a New York bred, Brian, a New York bred daughter of Dialed In. Um, and you mentioned Irad Ortiz. Trainer is Todd Pletcher, so you know what that's going to mean. Uh, regardless of what her record is, uh, she's probably going to get bet lower than what you might like to get on Dorth, uh, on, on That's the true. gambling girl. That's true, Matt. And, and she's only won a stakes race against New York bread. She hasn't broken through in open company yet, but she's shown me enough where I think she has a shot. And again, that gazelle slow pace and she made up a lot of ground. Don't sleep on gambling girl for uh, strong connections. As Matt mentioned, after that, the alleys look, Matt, uh, she was a stakes winner at Fairgrounds a couple starts back, the third Brad Cox on the, on the list. But last time I thought she was plenty disappointing in the fairground. Though. Yeah, yeah. And certainly those Brad Cox horses come with a lot of expectations, particularly off that uh, a bit of an upset win in the Silver Bullet Day. Yes, that uh, Fairground Oaks leaves me no confidence in the alley's look. She looks like the uh, the third of three for Brad Cox. We're going to end with three what I consider um, uh, wild cards here in the Kentucky Oaks. How good is Flying Connection? She's won four or five in New Mexico. Todd Fincher is known for bringing good horses out of New Mexico. She is one of the fastest early horses in the in the field with uh, in a field that doesn't look to have a ton of speed. Her last race was pretty impressive, winning the Sunland Park Oaks. Yeah, daughter of Nyquist, Kentucky Derby winner Nyquist. Uh, and you mentioned Todd Fincher. He certainly is the biggest name trainer uh, uh, on that Southwest circuit. True, true that. And Flying Connections is a horse that you might want to look at coming from New Mexico. Then you got a horse coming from Dubai, Mimi Kakushi. Um, she's only run at Maidan, five races at Dubai. She's won three in a row. She's won the last two stakes races at Maidan, including the UAE Oaks. On the other hand, so many UAE Oaks Phillies have come over, not done great in the Kentucky Oaks, and she just hasn't looked all that impressive in winning those races. Yeah, I agree. She won the 1,000 uh, Guineas, uh, which was a prep race for the UAE, UAE Oaks before that. And another one who has to be considered a wild card is the two-year-old Philly champion, Wonder Wheel. She's 0 for 2 this year. I thought her first race in Tampa wasn't bad for a first race. I thought she'd move forward in the grade one Ashland at a track where she's done well before Keeneland. But she just didn't do much in the Ashland. Yeah, yeah and, and at the beginning of our uh, segment here on the Kentucky Oaks, you rattled off some names of, hor of top horses who weren't, aren't even in the field. Well, Wonder Wheel almost wasn't in the field. She just got in. Uh, she just got in the other day, um, and uh, certainly 
disappointing beginning to the year, and that's why she just barely got in after winning the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies and being the two-year-old Philly champion. We still, we still have respect for Wonder Wheel, that's for sure. Um, she was the two-year-old Philly champion. She was a deserving champion. If you can draw a line through the Ashland, maybe she can bounce back in here, but you got to wonder if she's come back as good now 0 for 2 as a three-year-old Philly. All right, that's our look at the Kentucky Oaks, a little over a week out, 14 Phillies there, uh, an interesting addition. We hope you enjoyed the pace projection. Matt, let me get a parting shot from you before we say goodbye. Yeah, I guess when we come back next week, we'll have the daunting task of putting together the pieces that we've given you already when we uh, had our uh, pretender and contender show for the Kentucky Derby, and we talked about what we what Brian and I have a feeling about with the pace for the Derby. We'll have the post position draw on Monday, and then we'll have a show for you where we pull it all together, uh, give our top picks, give some wagers that we uh, are looking forward to trying out on Derby Day. Absolutely. Hey, folks, if you haven't yet hit subscribe, if you haven't uh, hit the uh, uh, turn on the notifications, if you haven't given us even a thumbs up for the show, we sure appreciate you doing that. Uh, and, and maybe down in the comment section, you could tell us if you liked us or you didn't like us or or why we're a couple of knuckleheads. But any of that, we appreciate it. Thanks, as always, for watching. Also, thanks to Timeform US for the pace projection we use today and often on the show. Thanks to our sponsor, the best contest site out there. That's Derby Wars. Can't wait to see you next week as we talk Derby, Derby, Derby right here on Horse Center. Until then, good luck.